This episode of the Pursuit Podcast is presented by Fisher Skis. What's up, all you cool cats and kittens? 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 I'm your host. This is the Pursuit Podcast. God's favorite influencer, Mr. Adam Max. We have a fantastic guest this week, Eric Porter. Uh, been a pro mountain biker in some way, shape, or form for over 20 years. So we talk about the early days, and I'm going to claim it. He doesn't like to claim it, but he was the first mountain biker to hit a handrail on his mountain bike. Talk about it. Talk about switching over to YouTube and how that's been, a, you know, that's that's what people do now. They, they're they content creators. They're influencers. But such a great episode with uh, Eric Porter. I think I'm on episode 65. Don't quote me on that. But before we get into the episode, I have to give a shout out to my sponsors, the thing that makes this all work. And first off is the feed, the feed.com, specifically Kyoku. It's a breakfast shake. Uh, you know, it's for crushing your KOMs. I don't have any KOMs to crush. Uh, I barely have like any actual times. But my favorite thing about this is it's a meal replacement. And I'm in the van, I'm cruising around. I can make Kyoku. It takes me two seconds to make. I put it in a little, I got like a little whipper. I don't know. I think it's made for like espresso drinks, but put some almond milk in there and it's fantastic. It gives me everything I need to get through the day and I don't have to make eggs and bacon and all that crazy stuff that you people who live in houses make. Go to thefeed.com forward slash the pursuit and get yourself some for free. Pay $5 shipping and we'll take care of the rest. Again, thefeed.com forward slash the pursuit. And my next sponsor, they are a flagship. They are the one and only Fisher Skis. They take care of myself and Adam Jabber, uh, specifically this Ranger line. It's so good. It's so versatile. It's one of my favorite skis that I skied last year, specifically like the Ranger 108. I wish I had a reason to ski it every day, but I live on the East Coast, so I'm falling more into that 102 range. That Celeste color is fire. Pink Ski Gang is dead and we'll keep it dead um but go check out fishersports.com their website's actually really nice to navigate you can see what they have there's a ton of videos on there and product videos and just a ton of information so again fishersports.com check them out i'm eric porter i'm a pro mountain biker and um yeah a lot of other things too but uh that's the that's the job and also what i love to do so that's that's what got us here today i guess and you've been doing this for how, well, let me ask, how long have you considered yourself a professional mountain biker? Uh, this has been, it's been 20 years now. Um, not even really considered myself, but you know, how I paid the bills, um, which is, you know, there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of talk these days about, uh, you know, with all the different ways you can make a living riding a mountain bike, which are all valid ways to be professional mountain bikers, but, um, yeah, that's, that's how I paid the bills for 20 years now. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's an interesting, I had, uh, Jonathan Buckhouse on, who's a professional snowboarder, but he's really a professional YouTuber, but without snowboarding, he wouldn't be a professional YouTuber. So he gets a lot of hate because he's not like winning the X game. He's not winning competitions, but he makes a living. He feeds his wife and his kids and provides, through snowboarding via YouTube. So it's like a, it's such an interesting question is like, what is pro? And you don't fall into that category. You've competed, you've won things. You, it's a totally different wheelhouse, but let's back up a little bit. We don't have to go. I mean, we'll go far back and then we'll jump forward to current, but like, did you know you were going to be a pro mountain biker? Was it even an avenue when you started to be like, I can make a living off of this, or do I just want to get in a magazine, make it into a video? What did this look like? What did kid Eric look like? So I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. <clears throat> so being a pro mountain biker was not um, even a remote possibility or even, even something you'd think about as, you know, um, it just wasn't a thing. And uh, I mean, for that matter, like pretty much anything saying you're going to be a professional athlete, uh, at that time, like in the say nineties, that wasn't even a thing. Like, uh, no one now there's a ton of, like a, everyone knows somebody that's making a living doing something cool. Um, but then that wasn't even an Avenue. Um, I did, however, want to be a pro snowboarder, um, which is just as funny being from Kentucky, but, um, 
Yeah, when I was, uh, I guess a lot of things happened when I was 12 in that my parents took me, my grandparents took me out to Colorado for the first time to go skiing. And so that opened my eyes to the mountains and, um, you know, really just big mountains. That's, and from that first second that, you know, driving West on I-70 out of Denver, like it, it was like, yeah, I gotta get out to the real mountains at some point. Um, and then when I was 12 was also when I got my first mountain bike. Um, and this was a, you know, a hundred dollar bike from Kmart, but it was technically a mountain bike. And I was lucky enough to have trails that I could ride to from my house. And that's basically where it started. And by the time I was 15, you know, I was trying to get a job at the local bike shop. And then the guys at the shop would take me to the races and kind of one thing led to another, um, and even going into college, I wanted to, the plan was to go to college in Colorado, um, so that I could snowboard more. So I could try to make it as a pro snowboarder with no real plan. Just like that was all I loved. I, I just loved watching snowboard videos and reading the magazines and wanted to do that all the time. Um, but we couldn't afford to go to school in Colorado. So, um, out of state tuition and everything. So I went to school in Kentucky, which ended up, I found that they had a mountain bike team and just started racing and meeting more people. And, um, that was basically what got me more into mountain bikes than snowboarding. I just want to touch on a couple of things. I love the fact that you hit, you were got to Denver and hook, took I 70 and we're like, I enjoy this. Cause most people listening are younger ears and I 70 now is like the number one road <laughs> in America that I want to avoid. That's true. Uh, it's, like it's changed <laughs> drastically. I don't want to date you, but we're going to a little bit, but you're like, Oh yeah, I got on I 70 and I was like, this is where I want to be. And I'm in my head. I'm like, I hate I 70. I never want to. No, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Cause uh, I'm sure there was traffic and stuff then too, but it was, um, it was uh, like, if there was, I wouldn't have cared if we sat in a traffic jam for eight hours because I'd be looking at the mountains and um, just the, the happiest person alive to be in the big mountains, um, that you'd only seen in pictures before that. Um, but yeah, that's hilarious. Cause yeah, now it's, uh, <laughs> a different experience driving from Denver to the, you know, summit County. A hundred percent. Who was your favorite snowboarder at the time? Is there, is there a name that sticks out? I mean, uh, yeah, the name that sticks out was, uh, Sean Palmer actually, because he was, um, yeah, he was the mountain biker and the snowboarder. I mean, he would he could do anything. And so he was winning border cross. He was this is kind of after his freestyle era, but this is when he was like X Games winning border cross and then also racing downhill mountain bikes and um just dominating everything. Um a completely different personality than me. I've never been that super um uh, whatever, you know, like where I'm the best kind of that Sean Palmer, Muhammad Ali type of mentality. Um, but I just respected that he was really good at snowboarding and mountain bikes. And that's what I looked up to. I love that you say Sean Palmer. Cause that was like my, I went to Sea Otter this year and they had like one of his downhill bikes. And I was like, there's all this new tech at Sea Otter. And I'm just staring at this, like, I don't know what bike he was on, but this downhill Sean Palmer branded, like awful tech now downhill bike but like in the winter <laughs> games he did like skier cross border cross and then they did like that downhill in the winter he like yeah had that on. i mean he was he motocross race he literally was like the era of just like loose and fast yeah <laughs> just like <laughs> completely out of control but always somehow in control and just like I, yeah i don't know i love to see what he's doing now um that would be an interesting i actually i think his his ambulancer's trailer just got robbed there was just like a kickstarter or a gofundme like sean, saw that like all of his stuff sean palmer yeah. if you're listening you're all of our heroes because you set the bar extremely high <laughs> totally but, yeah and then on the freestyle side of snowboarding uh my first board was a hawkinson and so i mean everybody looked up to him he's one of the greatest of all time for sure um and then straight into the, you know, the forum era, um, all right, looking at all those guys. So, yeah, <laughs> but it's crazy now through every, through life, I've gotten to be pretty good friends with Jeremy Jones, which is, you know, insane that I would, you know, call him a, a, a friend and ride with him and hang out with him and stuff. So it's, it's crazy what, what life will bring you, you know? Yeah. It's crazy that, you know, 20 years ago, 
everyone was just punks who wanted to ride their mountain bike every day or ski or snowboard every day. And now, you know, Jeremy Jones was just at like the Capitol, you know, for protect our winners. And it's like, I don't think you ever, Oh, the other one. Oh, 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 Jeremy Jones. Yeah. The other Jeremy Jones. Yeah. So big mountain, Jeremy, they both are incredible. And, um, Big the fan of both, um, but yeah, forum Street Jeremy, Jeremy Jones. Jones. Street Jeremy yep, Jones. From forum. Yeah, he's he's actually way into mountain bikes now. Um, so it's super cool to that That's all the amazing. everyone that I looked up to is um, who would you, never used to mountain bike. It was snowboarders would skate all summer, um, and mountain biking wasn't cool. And now all the skaters and snowboarders and everyone they're on to mountain bikes, which is um, which is really cool. I think it's a testament to who you are as a human because mountain biking wasn't cool 20 years ago. And I mean this, hang on. Hey, I mean this, like if you look at an old mountain bike, they're scary. Like they were just making things up. There's just like big old coils like that. Look, look like they came out of like a Lincoln continental and like horrible geometry. Like mountain biking was scary. And the things that you guys were doing you were just, it was almost like jackass for lack of a better term. You were just like making it up and just seeing if it worked and how it worked and what worked better. So like to be, you know, now your life has changed and the geometry bikes have changed and everything, but like it was an insane time of like mountain bike progression from yeah. then. No, to absolutely. Now. It was, um, it wasn't easy to get into mountain biking. They weren't cheap then, um, you know, money to money they were still expensive then you know um not exchange rate but uh with inflation yeah, yeah. they were they were expensive uh they were always expensive and they weren't that good and the trails were hard there were rocks and roots and that was your only option there was no such thing as a flow trail or anything kind of easy to learn how to mountain bike on really so you had to love it for some reason love how difficult it was or um doing hard stuff. I don't know. And then you had to basically find a mentor as well. So you had to find people that were willing to take you in under their wing and show you the ropes and, um, how to work on bikes and where to ride and all that stuff. It was, it's just so much easier now to, for people to get into it. Yeah. It's, I guess the, I guess the only advantage is that there was no quote unquote path. Like now people, kids growing up can be like, they go to like, schools and they offer mountain biking and they go to like it's a different it's become a thing that you can actually make a career out of or even maybe your parents support you a little more because i'm sure your parents when you were like i'm going to be a pro mountain biker they were like that doesn't exist like you're going to be an accountant <laughs> like, it was um you know they're always supportive um they definitely wanted me to go to college and uh i'm really glad that i did and i'm glad that it uh things worked out as a pro athlete after college because I had that much more life experience and perspective and, you know, working jobs I didn't like and things like that to make, uh, this, you have more perspective on how good it is as well. What did you study in college? Um, I started out in computer science and then I quickly realized that that would mean I would be sitting in a computer all the time. And so I, switched over to outdoor recreation and kind of tourism resort management type of, uh, thing and ended up doing my internship at a ski area in, uh, Indiana, Paley peaks, Indiana, where I, that was my local resort that I'd go to all the time. And it was awesome. I got to do everything at the resort from run events to ski school, to the snowboard park, train park. Um, it was, it was cool. Um, so that was always, Cause it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really like I wanted to be a pro mountain biker and almost until it was happening because it really wasn't a possibility. It was like, I'm going to try, but I'm going to, you know, work at a resort. I'm going to work for forest service or do something outside just so I'm doing something in outdoor recreation and I'm happy. Maybe work for a bike company or whatever. It was, that was always the, the main plan, but it was see what I can, you know, just have fun and see where I can go with it in the meantime. Yeah. And I mean, best case, you were going to get like a bike frame out of it. You were just going to make your hobby, like pay for itself a little bit at that time. It wasn't like they were not like anybody's just throwing dollars around, but you can, you're living off of mountain biking now versus then it was like, Hey, if I can get a free frame 
and I'm speculating, but like, and get to ride my bike more and like maybe get a magazine, get in a magazine. Like that's cool. Like I can do that on the side. Yeah. It's pretty interesting how it worked out actually for me. Um, so when, uh, so late nineties, the Norbas and the UCI world cups and everything were huge. This was when like Palmer, I feel like it was, he had a half million dollar contract with specialized. So there was more money in it than, I, I don't know, compared to now dollar for dollar, but there was more money in it than in any other time, you know? And, um, so that was the path that I was trying to do. I was racing semi-pro downhill and I was trying to make it as a racer in downhill and, um, chasing all the Norbas and everything. But in between the races, we were, I had kind of fallen in with, uh, hanging out with Aaron Chase, Jeff Lenoski, Kyle Abbott, George Ryan, all these guys that were, they were from the East coast and they were all racers, but they really love street riding and skate parks and dirt jumping and things like that. So in between every race, we were all doing that sort of thing instead of training when we should have been resting or training or doing whatever to be faster racers, we were just doing what we loved. And, and at the time chase and, uh, Lenoski and Abbott, they were making videos as well. So these were the first like street riding videos and, Again, that wasn't a segment and slope style wasn't a thing until all of a sudden it was. And somehow the industry and everybody took notice of what we were doing. Um, and that was right when I was kind of coming up into that scene and, you know, Chase was starting to film me and let me be in those videos a little bit. Um, and all of a sudden it kind of blew up. So I got a cover of a magazine grinding a handrail on my hardtail, my dirt jumper and a flow magazine, which was like the, I don't know, one of the first few issues of that. And it was like a kind of free ride street dirt jump focus magazine. And then at the same time, within that next year, there were dirt jump contests and street contests and the first crankwork slope style. It was called Joyride that first year up at Whistler. And I did well in those. And so it went from, I probably wasn't fast enough to make it as a racer and was kind of figuring that out to there was another Avenue. And within a year I had a job doing that, um, which was pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Just right time, right place. Clearly you had the skill set, but like, it just, it just happened. Like you hit the wave at the perfect time. Totally. Um, yeah. Cause I had actually, when I graduated from, this was within the year of grad after graduating from college, I graduated from college and the plan was to move to Durango and, um, I was getting exactly like you said, getting frames from iron horse to, um, you know, to, to race and that sort of thing. And I got a, a job offer from the product manager there and it was, you know, uh, moved to long Island, be an assistant product manager. And it was like the industry job, which is kind of the dream and like a great scenario. Um, but the money wasn't great. And, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I, I looked at what the travel would be and what the, like what my life would actually be like. And it wouldn't be traveling around riding bikes. And so I turned it down and within a year actually, um, was a paid athlete for them and had a signature frame. And, uh, <laughs> so somehow turned things, uh, it was just taking a big risk, um, that actually paid off. I haven't heard the name Iron Horse in a long time. Um, I had an Iron Horse. I wish I knew what frame I had back in the early 2000s. It had to be, but um, I haven't heard that name in a while. So that was that's an interesting brand. Um, I don't know if they still do. They still exist. Is that still a thing? No, not really. So. Um, they. I don't know the exact details, but um, I think sometime around the financial, right, the meltdown in 08 or whatever, mid 2000s, I think they basically folded and then sold the name to somebody. So somebody owns the the brand, the brand, I'm sure, but yeah. there's no. Yeah, it's probably sold device. at some big box store yeah. somewhere, which is fine. I did read, and you can confirm or deny this, that you were the first to hit handrails on a mountain bike. As far as I know, um, yeah, I, I'm always careful to claim first and that sort of thing. But as far as I know, I was the first to grind handrails on a mountain bike. But you weren't. Uh, 
Sorry to interrupt you, but you weren't oh, doing okay. it on pegs. No. Like you were frame sliding, correct? Yeah. So it was on um, like the bottom of my fork leg, the bottom of my crank arm and like bottom of the chain stay basically. Um, so it's only about, you know, an inch, inch and a half of space, maybe two. Um, so pretty, pretty precise. Um, but, and it's funny, the reason why I ended up doing it that way is because, so I'd wrote a little bit of BMX. I, I didn't grow up riding BMX. I grew up racing cross country. And, um, so when I was in college, I got a BMX to learn how to street ride better and dirt jump and do all that stuff. And I had pegs and I was always kind of fascinated by handrails with, um, you know, being in snowboarding and, um, being, being into BMX and everything like that. So, but I'd never done one. So the first one I wanted to, I tried to actually go do a a real street rail. Um, I tried to hop on and my back peg hung up on the vertical support and just stopped me, (laughs) threw me straight to my face and knocked all my teeth out there, broke everything. And, um, yeah. So that was it for pegs for me. <laughs> um, and then I, I don't know why, but at some point I started jumping onto ledges at skate parks. Um, the Louisville skate park where I grew up had a uh, really nice ledges and I could figure it out that I could hop on and kind of stall like that. And then I figured that I could hop and slide like that. And it actually worked pretty good for me. And then uh, rails worked as well. As long as you're you kind of have the wheels to kind of guide it in. So, um, as long as you have a lot of time on the bike and know where the different parts of your bike are, as far as like, if you, you know, say bunny hop wheel bonk, something with your front tire, if you know how to place your bike, it wasn't actually that bad. Um, and it worked out really well for me. I, I did a lot of, uh, pretty fun rails and didn't get hurt too bad, uh, doing them either after the, as long as I took the pegs off. <laughs> It seems like you took something hard and made it harder, but it worked better for you in some way, shape or form. Totally. It, um, it worked way better for me. And the funny thing was, is it made no sense to most other people. So like my heroes, even Lenoski and Hans Ray, um, and Chase, they, they were always trying to figure out how I did it. And I mean, I mean, it was crazy to me to have the people that I looked up to in videos, um, they, they'd become friends at that point, but to have them asking me, how do you do this? Um, it that was, make sense. it was bizarre because it made a lot of sense to me and was pretty easy. Um, but I don't know. That's, I think that's ends up how a lot of people being, um, uh, are really successful is they figure out how to do something unique really well that a lot of other people can't figure out how to do. And I'm, I'm thinking of the era. This is like V brakes going to like disc brakes here. Are you running V brakes longer later to avoid a disc brake? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, no, that was good. Good insight there. Um, on the timing and everything. So I, on my dirt jump bike, I ran V brakes for a few years longer. I think than um, than other people were because of that exact reason um, where we had uh, disc brakes on all of our other bikes or cross country bikes or downhill bikes. All that was disc brake. Um, but on the um, dirt jumper, yeah, V brake. And it was easy to work on. It wasn't hydraulic, any of that stuff. Um, the last rail that I actually did was over in Spain and it was a pretty gnarly rail. It was 20 steps and full drop off on one side steps on the other. So if, if I had jumped, if I had fallen over the outside of the rail, uh, I would have fallen, you know, a full 20 foot drop to the concrete in another country. Um, and at that point I had disc brakes on my bike cause they weren't even, nobody was even putting, um, what are they called? The bosses on the frame for the, the brake bosses there. Um, so it was, wasn't even an option. And, we saw that rail and we were on a film trip and I wanted to do it. The only option was to actually take the rotors off and, or just a back rotor, but maybe I had from, I can't either way, take the rotors off and be fully brakeless on it. Um, luckily it worked out well. And that was actually the last rail I ever ended up doing. And when was that? When's the last time you hit a handrail? I think that was 2010. Pretty sure. That's 12 years. Uh, 
yeah so no it's been well, i was it's in it's in the head still like i see rails i'm like oh that's a good one i would love to do that <laughs> or even like maybe like skate park rail, a little more controlled rails not like a full-on street segment rail yeah yeah and that was another thing um i got in the mindset the filming mindset which is what you do when you're trying to push the sport and be a, a top level athlete of i'm not doing something easier than i've already done like i'm only going one direction with my progression and um yeah so that like i don't think i ever went back in difficulty with rails so it was always kind of stepping up and once i did that one i I feel like I kind of knew I was like, oh, I'm probably not doing anything gnarlier than that one. So that might be it. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is the peak or pinnacle of my yeah. filming segment. Cause you went from competitions to filming film segments, which is like just the, what you just said, like the, you know, it's, it's, you have to one up yourself and you have to one up everybody else. You know, you yeah. have to have your, you want to be the closer. You want to be the opener. Like you, that's, how long did you film like that? Um, I think 2010, I think that was when I, um, so 2010 was my last year with Haro and the next year I was with Diamondback. And when I switched from Haro to Diamondback, I basically figured in my head, like, this is my opportunity to make the shift of what I, into what I want to be doing. Um, Cause 2010, I was still competing as well. Um, but it was like, my scariest best run would maybe qualify or be on the bubble for soap style finals. So, um, so that's where it was. Um, basically when I started talking to diamondback, my goal was I want to film mountain biking on trails and adventures and going to crazy countries and, um, you know, still doing free ride stuff too, but a lot of just regular trail bike stuff, um, and camping and, just showing the the lifestyle of it. I, I start. I'd watch a lot of snowboard and surf and skate and other things. And I felt like, uh, mountain biking was way too product focused and to, um, I, it just didn't have enough, uh, stuff promoting the lifestyle that, which is what most people just want. Most people want to have a good time on their bike, riding around in the woods, camping, uh, adventuring, checking out new places and seeing the world by bike. And so that was basically what I proposed to Diamondback is that that's what I want to promote. I want to do, you know, I'll still do dirt jump stuff, downhill stuff, but re in reality, uh, most people just ride mountain bikes and they want to watch stuff that can take them out of their regular life, uh, regular world and transport them somewhere cool and give them something to dream about, you know? Yeah. And it, it seems like you were really ahead of the curve on like the relatable content. And I don't want to say influencer cause, and I will, cause I always do. I say this every, in every part, I'm like, eh. but like you were ahead of the curve as far as like now brands are like, we want someone, we want an athlete that people can relate to. And like, sure you can do your way better mountain biker than me. That's fact. Like, great. But like, you can go to a local trail trail system and like, just rip it. And I'm like, Oh, I can hit that line or I can do that which then sells product. But like 10 years ago, no one was really doing that. You had to be the most extreme, you know, rat, like whatever. We can use all the stupid buzz terms that they like called our sports Mountain Dew and Cheetos and like, you know, it, like extreme. <laughs> yeah. But it's exact extreme Doritos, you know, all the branding and, and 2010, that was still happening. And, you pitching to diamondback and being like, Hey, I'm still going to do all these. I'm, you know, I might step back a little bit. Like you start, you probably starting to think about a family at this point, but, or I had a, a two-year-old at that yeah, point. So yeah. So there you go. But like, it's relatable content. And that was pre athletes, probably pitching relatable content. Was YouTube a, like a thing yet? I mean, YouTube existed, but like, was it what it is now? No, not at all. Uh, it's funny. We actually avoided YouTube because they were copyright checking for music. So if we use Vimeo or like say pink bike or whatever, uh, you know, vital, they all had their own, um, uh, media video players. And so everyone wanted to, 
uh, every media outlet wanted the video for themselves because then they, if everyone had their own player, then they could sell their own ads on those videos. And so it's a completely different model. Um, and uh, yeah, Bike Magazine as well. And um, they all had their own players until everyone realized in YouTube as well that um, hosting fees and storage and all that stuff costs a lot of money. And so you, when YouTube, this is much later, um, you know, but when they, when they figured out that they could start paying the creators, that's when that all changed into there being something called a YouTuber as a job. Um, and it's funny, you know, like you could, I started out, I was a pro writer and then, um, yeah, you could call it influencer. You could call it a uh, YouTuber. It's funny. Kids now recognize me as a YouTuber. That's what they call me. That doesn't matter that I'm a pro writer. A YouTuber is higher in the, you know, hierarchy of things you can do with your life. Like YouTuber is better than pro athlete to most of the kids these right. days. So whatever, I'll take it. I, it's just a, just a label. Uh, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> and um, if, but yeah. It's just so crazy. Cause it's like, you know, it's just the progression of a 20 year career, but it's like, you know, are you filming producing? Do you have staff who like films with you comes with your family? Cause you trap. So now you've made it to the point where like, at least in, obviously it's what you're showing us, but like, Life looks great. Like you just got back from where were you? Ecuador with your whole Ecuador, family yeah. and like your wife's riding, your kids are riding, you're sharing the sport. Like looks great. All is butterflies and rainbows, right? Like that's, you know, that's YouTube. But like, are, do you have a full-time filmer? Are you guys filming? Are your kids holding the cameras the whole time? Like, what does this look like? And what is it? Is there a script? a script or at least like a shot list idea, you know, obviously your kids aren't like reading lines, but like, what does this look like? Yeah. Um, well, I want to touch on one more point with uh, what you were saying before with kind of figuring things out with, um, transitioning from being a pro, like, you know, competing in that sort of thing to relatable stuff. Um, and that really came from, talking to friends of mine that were not in the bike industry. Cause when you're at the top of your sport, you only care about like at the time I only cared about what say bear claw or Aaron chase or like the top athletes, the other top riders, what they think of what I'm doing, because that's how you keep raising the bar. If you're looking at what other people are doing outside that are just watching that sort of thing, you're behind, right? Cause you got to, you only care about validation from the other top level athletes. Right. right. So I started talking to friends that weren't that, that they were outside the industry and they're just consumers that buy bikes and just good long time friends. And like, Hey, what do you like to watch? What do you care about? And that's exactly what they were telling me is like, I like seeing, you know, trail riding and adventures and stuff like that stuff that I can relate to. I can't relate to doing a double backflip, but I can relate to, riding along a river and going fly fishing and having a good uh, time doing that sort of thing. So once I realized that, and then combined with this goes back to what makes you a pro rider. Um, so why am I paid as an athlete? Bottom line is I'm paid to sell bikes. Right. Um, and I'm part of the marketing department. So if what I'm doing isn't getting more people interested in the brand and buying bikes, then why are they paying me? And so it's, you know, it's kind of a cold way to look at it from, you know, everyone wants to be a pro skater, snowboarder, bike rider, because you're good. That's only part of it. Um, the main thing is connecting with the audience and having an audience and that sort of thing. So that's where, you know, people now that if you've got a big YouTube following a big Instagram following, whatever it is, if you're, if you're, you know, have a good big community around you locally even, um, then that brings a lot of value to a bike company because that's how you can communicate to your potential customers. Right. Um, and so that's why, yeah, there's different types of pro riders. There's, uh, but the main thing is you, if you have an audience and if people are following what you're doing, then you can be a pro rider at this point, you know? Yeah. And I think you like you, again, it's a 20 year plus career here. So it's not, you know, the definition of pro rider of 
you in your early years, pro rider, it was competition film. And now it's, you know, you said you're, you're taking giant risks and your competition and you're like on the bubble. So it's like the writing's on the wall as far as like, okay, this, you know, there's always younger, there's always faster, there's always dumber, there's always people willing yeah. to risk it. Um, they don't have anything to lose, maybe. You know, like, it's a total, it's just life. It's evolution of sport. And, you know, I think we do hide a lot of those, you know, we call it progression. And it's like, you can get, you know, we're still riding bikes, so we're still skiing and, like, serious injuries can happen and we hide behind progression, which is so I, a whole nother conversation with me. I would love to have, but, um, cause it is, we, there's 13 year olds out there who d- may not even know the risks that they're taking yet. But yeah, that scares me as well. Seeing that. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, um, you know, going back to what you said as well about, um, the snowboard YouTuber who gets looked down on, by the snowboard community. Um, I think it's good to have everything. So not everybody's going to relate to a pro snowboarder. Some people want to hear it from a, a regular guy. And now we have uh, someone for everybody to look up to. And that's the coolest part about, um, the, you know, the way that sponsorship has changed recently is that, you know, there's representation from all different communities and types of people. So you can have a role model within the bike industry that you can look up to that's doing something cool that you can say, I can be that because, uh, because that person is that, you know, even from, I I love going back to visit in Kentucky because, um, until I had done this, there's no precedent for a kid from Kentucky making a living riding a bike, you know, um, and so it's, it's cool to have that for more than just people like me or like the top level pro athlete, like, Hey, you can do something unique and build an audience through YouTube or Instagram and also make a living riding a bike. Yeah. So that's, that's really cool. It's, it's evolving and it's continuing and it's like, it's bizarre. Like I'm 36. So like, I assume we're close in age and it's like, I didn't think this was going to be like, like I, technically I'm a professional podcaster and it's like, well, you know, like I'm not getting rich off this by any means, but like, it's crazy. Like, I didn't even think you could do this. Like this, that this exists is bizarre to me. Yeah. You would have closest thing would be like a a radio, uh, you know, channel host or something, which again, there's like seven of them. So how are you going to get that job? Yeah. Like, (laughs) it's just a crazy, and you know, the, the kid who started this is he, they just started doing it and you just keep doing it and people value your opinion and then you grow. And then, you know, now there's four shows on our network weekly and like, that's crazy. And it's just, yeah. we, you know, we have an audience and we have people who might care or might just hate what we say, but want to hear something stupid. I say every week and they want to argue with me and that's perfect. You need that, you know? And it's like, it's, it's just a crazy thing that exists that didn't exist X years ago or, you know, and now, you know, we're, we're pushing our YouTube because we're seeing people like you being like, what do you have? A hundred and I wrote 172,000 followers on YouTube. Like if a 10th of those people see the video because of the algorithm, like that's 17,000 people. Like that's yeah, crazy. Like picture, we were talking about it at a fire yesterday. My buddy was like, I got 600 followers. And I was like, that's a lot of people. Like it's not, but like if you filled a room with 600 people and you had to speak, that's a lot of people. Like, Oh yeah. (laughs) It's insane. And you can reach them from your phone. Like you're just like, boom, you have connection to all of those people and it's corny and cliche, but it's, it's the evolution of athlete. It's the evolution of sport. And it's, it's changing the way we define pro athlete pro it. How do you define it? Do you make a living off it? Absolutely. And you know, people, uh, athletes get scared of it or they say, well, I had to, you know, I had to do this to get where I'm at. They should have to as well. And it's just not a good way to, it's not a healthy way to look at it. You know, like, yeah, I had to, 
it was crazy what I had to do to get here. I lived in a van and uh, I, you know, broke myself off and I had to do everything. I had to put everything into it. And so that I could meet the right people and get turned down and shut down for years until it finally things worked out, you know, and I had to win contests and I had to get magazine covers. So yeah, it was not easy at all. Not, none of it was easy, but I'm grateful for that too. But I'm also, I think it's really cool that, uh, you know, with Instagram and YouTube, it gives people a chance to um, live their dreams and get their voice out there as well. Um, it do doesn't have to happen the same way. And you can either evolve and adapt like I've done um, and just say, okay, this is the deal now. Cool. I'll do this and, you know, figure out how to understand it and everything. Um, and, you know, we get people like, I mean, my teammate, Seth, uh, from Burn Peak, Seth Spike Hacks, you know, he's massive, the biggest mountain bike YouTuber, really. And he's just a normal guy, normal rider, and is really good at storytelling and kind of figured out how to make videos and um, has a huge audience now. It's also funny, you look at his videos from like three years ago, because you look at them now and you're like, I could never do that. Those are insane quality and story and everything else. And you look at his videos from a few years ago and they weren't like they were still good for then, but you know, just constant evolution as a human and trying to get better at stuff. And um, yeah. So anyway, just always uh, that's my advice to riders is always just keep adapting and uh, learning and getting better, you know? Yeah. Don't get frustrated because other people are succeeding in different ways. Yeah. Be like, happy for them. It's, it's jealousy is not, uh, <laughs> not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> And Seth is a perfect example. And some of Seth's videos are so dumbed down, for lack of a better term, but it's like how to change a bike tire. You have to learn at some point. And if you don't have a mentor to just tell you how to change a bike tire, like some people don't. Some people just, they just don't have it. And it's like, that's useful. That is so, yeah. you know, and he it's is expensive like. expensive to get it done at a shop and you're going to need to learn how to anyway. And, um, yeah, you really have to, I struggle with this because, uh, you know, when I first started hanging out with Seth, uh, you know, he was trying to talk me into starting a YouTube channel, <laughs> um, which I should have done years before yeah, I did yeah. and taken his advice. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's, he was like, you know, my life is normal because I live it. And so it's normal to me. And after coming out, staying with me, he's like, your life is so far from normal. Um, like what, just how I live, what I do, where I go, all that stuff. Um, so that when, when you do talk to people, like you need to just start at the basic level because most people don't know, like, even if like, they don't know what a split board is, they don't know what a, if you assume that your audience is at a very high level, then you've shrunk your audience quite a bit because someone that doesn't know what they're talking about is going to watch it and say, I have no idea what they're talking about. I'm going to watch something else. Right. And that's not even an insult. Like you're not, you know, I think it can, I'm saying that out loud because I think people might take that as like an insult. Like, oh, if you start it, you know, here and like you dumb it down and maybe that's an insult, maybe that's wrong. But it's like, no, you're just, I can't assume that everyone knows what I'm talking about. Or I can't assume that like, because I'm a ski nerd that like everyone else is. Like even when it comes to bikes, like I really love mountain biking. I am not a bike nerd. Like I just ride it. Like I love riding mountain bikes. I'm not good at it at all. I have a dentist bike. It's way nicer than like any of my skill set. Like I'm not horrible, but like I just really, I put 130 miles on my mountain bike this week. Like that's good for an average that's human awesome. being. Like, but I'm not good. But you coast miles too. <laughs> yeah. Like I grinded out some miles. Like I love riding my mountain bike, but people assume I'm good at it. And then we ride and they're like, go ahead. And I'm like, no, I'm bad. Like I, you are going to be so far ahead of me and that's fine. But like, it's, you know, when people, when I talk to people or meet at my trailheads or especially with the podcast now, they like assume I'm going to be like, and I'm like, no, I just really like it. And I'm cool with that. Like, you know, we roll up to like a big drop or rollover and I'm like, I'll ride around it. And like, you got it. And I'm like, I might, but if I don't, <laughs> then I can't ride tomorrow. And that's yeah. cool. I'm totally cool with that. And it's like, that's the best part about sport to me is like, you can just enjoy it. People forget well, it's that. Fun. It's fun. Uh, 
like I'm sure you're at a pretty high level at other sports. And that's probably what makes mountain biking so fun is because every time you go out, you're learning and getting better. And that's part of what I love about, you know, doing other sports um, is that you can, the, I think some of the most fun part of a sport is when you're progressing quickly and when you're learning things. And um, maybe that's part of it too. Yeah. It's just, but like, you know, we were riding and they all want to do this like diamond. And I was like, I'm going to go do the blue because I can like almost clear all those jumps. And if I do it one more time, I'll get there. I can go hang on on the diamond. Like I'll, I can get through it. I have this, but I'm just hanging on for dear life. I'm chattering all over the place. Like I'll go to the blue and I'll have a good time and I'll learn and I'll progress. And like, I'm fine with that. I love that. And that's, you know, I think people, and maybe this is a tangent or even a swerve, but like people are scared to like learn or like not be good at something. And it's like, who cares? Just have, just enjoy it. Like be a kid. Think about when you're a kid. Like you want to learn, you want to get better, but like you just do things. You're not embarrassed. You're not, it's like, that's where I see in my life, at least like these extreme sports being like the greatest things on the planet. My girlfriend rode with us all weekend and she's slower than us. And she's like, I'm slow. And we're like, you're not even close to like the slowest people that we ride with. Like, in this group, you're the slowest, but in the neck, in the Tuesday night group, you're, you are the first, like you were the fifth in this group. You'd be like, you know what I mean? It's just all relative yeah. who you're, if I'm riding with you guys, I'm the slowest guy in the group by far or girl, whatever. It doesn't matter if I'm right. You know, it's just, who cares? Just, are you having fun? Good. It's all that matters. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's just, it's so fun for anybody these days. The bikes are so good and the trails are so good that it's crazy. You can really take. I mean, uh, like Deer Valley, for example, there's, um, they've got a trail called Holy Roller from the top. That's the, just the best green trail ever. Um, and they'll take, uh, like you'll see a five-year-old on it and then you'll see a 70 year old on it and everybody's having fun mountain biking. It's not, um, it's not like it's has to be gnarly anymore. No, um, and I think there's, you know, too much emphasis on gnarly really um especially because mountain biking i think you build confidence much quicker than you build skill and so <laughs> people get in over their heads really quick and yeah I, I, re I really don't think mountain biking needs to have the reputation that it does for breaking people off you know yeah i think mountain biking the best way i can describe it to like people who don't do it is everything's fine till it's not yeah like, that's how <laughs> it is for me like i'm good i'm good i'm good and then i'm like Boom. And I'm like, what just happened and how? Like, I've ridden that a thousand times. And like, you know, maybe it's misting and we're on the East Coast and there's just a little more, or it's early and there's a little moisture on that route that you've hit a thousand times. You're gone. Your front tire's gone. It's over. Like, everything's fine till it's not. And that's, I love it. I'm, it happens quick. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I love it. And I just think people, are scared to learn and maybe we did all that and like but it's like i don't know i could call 99 percent of my friends and say we have a beginner and they'd be pumped like no one cares in all the best way there's always right. a couple people who gatekeep or whatever but like we'll wait that at the just depends on what your goals are for the ride right yeah it's just uh same thing with like uh building a getting a touring group together in the winter like uh as long as you all have the same goals of we're going out for a cruise to have fun. Right. Then everyone can have fun together. Yeah. There's always a mission. Sometimes right. like there's mission ri <laughs> uh, rides or like, Hey, we're doing whatever today. If you can't do that, don't join us. Cause you know, but within reason, but yeah. everyone's like more willing to open arms and hang out and wait for you at the top and or bottom and or intersection. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's why I, I think it's been such an amazing family sport for us and for a lot of families is it's something that the whole crew can do together, especially as, you know, more bike parks get built and trail centers that have, you know, a pump track and then a green trail and a blue trail and there's zones for progression. So everybody can go out and have fun doing the same thing at the same place. And you're, you're not just uh, not to look down on team sports, but you're not going to just sit there while your kid plays soccer or whatever it is. Um, you know, and we did all that stuff too. So if the kids are into that, great. Um, but 
you know, it's been really great to have this as a, a family sport that we can do together. And then in the winter, same thing with skiing and snowboarding. It's um, there's not that many activities that you can have an individual experience with um, with your whole family or crew or friends or whatever. Yeah. Let's talk about family a little bit and we don't have to go like two, but like, was it a conscious decision to put them on your YouTube and it, you know, cause like you're, ex- you're exposing them to in some extent and like you're telling their stories and their crashes and their failures and their, you know, they're not failures, they're victories They're But like, was that something that you and your wife were like, okay, we're going to film them. We're going to put them out there. And like, sure, it fits your story, but like, it could be a little like, you know, these kids grew up as YouTubers, which is interesting. Like, I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean it in any way. I don't have kids. I have no idea. And I think to me, looking at it, you're selling exactly what you said. Like how many sports can you go do and enjoy this individually as a family? That's the greatest yeah. thing on the planet. And it gives hope to anybody else who's like, I'm having a family, I'm done. And it's like, no, 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 you can do all these cool things. But was it a conscious conversation or did it just happen naturally progression? This is what you do. This is how it works. Or what did that look like? It was, uh, it's always been a supernatural thing because I've always had people over filming and shooting videos and TV shows, car ads, whatever it is. Um, and they're over here and the kids are out and about doing whatever. And, um, so they've just always naturally been a part of it and enjoyed being a part of it and doing what we're doing. Um, so it wasn't, I wouldn't say we had the discussion of like, do we want them to be in the public eye or not? Um, it was more of just, do they want to be doing what we're doing? Um, and if they don't like the stuff that they're not in, they wanted to do something else that day or whatever, or it was something just for me, but, um, you know, with the backyard video specifically, I just ask them, Hey, we're going to, I'm going to do this. Do you guys want to be a part of it? Or they'll say, Hey dad, why don't we build this and say, cool. Do you want to, should we shoot that and make a video out of it? And, um, if they're into it, cool. If they're like, no, let's just do it and have fun. Then, okay. We won't shoot it. Like, you know, going to, I'm going to Mount Mike, Oregon next week. Um, and Milo's coming with me, my 12 year old last year, we went as well. And I said, Hey, do you want to shoot a video here? And he said, no, I kind of just want to ride. And so it was cool. Let's just ride. Um, so it's just been really straightforward talking to him about it and having those conversations. Um, and then, you know, with YouTube, that's when it, everything really took off. Um, cause I, they'd been in stuff before in like a magazine article or something about me, about my family, about writing. Um, but they've definitely take a more, taken a more forward facing role with YouTube. And that was, um, also just you know, that was when I was doing stuff that I wanted to do for my YouTube channel when it was really small pre COVID. And I realized that I should start engaging in that space, making videos, learning how to do it. Cause, um, yeah, it's, it's going to take, takes you a year to even just make a bunch of videos and learn from your mistakes and kind of get better. But when COVID happened and all of a sudden we're locked down, it was okay. I'm going to go out and build in the yard and shoot videos about that. And, they were just there with me. Um, so I'm rebuilding the pump track. They're rebuilding the pump track and I'm teaching them stuff. And so it just ended up being that they were a large part of it and people loved it as well. Cause they could relate to it. Like you said, and, um, we had a lot of fun doing it. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, I get to bring my kids to work with me in the best possible way. So we can kind of have fun and share our experiences with everybody. I can teach them stuff and, um, and then everybody relates to it and enjoys seeing it as well. Yeah. And I think it gives hope to like, again, to like those like <laughs> rad dads with the three-year-old at home who are like, ah, and you're like, no, you're not like, this is just going to get cooler. Like one, you, yeah. you always have two kids there to help you dig, <laughs> like even yeah. in the simplest <laughs> form, but no, it, it's interesting and it's, it's fun to watch and it's neat to see. Your one video has 5.7 million views. Like that yeah, is crazy. That is insane. <laughs> I mean, that's the bar. Like, how do you ever beat that? Right. But like, I think you answered it already. It's you just go out and you're like, well, this is what I'm doing today. Or what do you guys want to do today? And you just film it. And I think that's what makes it 
the purest, more, most organic, real thing because it is. And if they don't want to film, they're not paid actors. Like, you're done. Okay, then let's right. go. Uh, like, it's time to be, you know, we'll go right Yeah, bikes. that's the last thing I want is uh, for them to hate riding or hate filming or hate being around me because of this. Um, so I'm super aware of that. And I'm probably to a fault almost. Um, but because that's the last thing I want. I've seen so many kids burn out. I've seen, I mean, I've seen so many talented kids that are um, start competing early. And I mean, we see it here in Park City all the time with like ski racing kids racing every weekend at whatever, six years old or something. And I've never been into that. So like my kids have hardly competed in anything. We've traveled a lot and ridden a lot though, but I didn't really um, have much interest in getting them into contests until they were really ready and really wanted to. Um, and <clears throat> these are just lifelong sports that we do, I think, uh, riding bikes and snowboarding and skiing and whatever. And I hope to be doing them when I'm 70. And um, that's, that's just what I want to pass on to the kids is having having something that you can do that's fun, that's healthy, that's good for your mental health as well. And, um, that you can do by yourself the rest of your life. It's, you know, uh, not something like as soon as you're out of school, you don't have a team anymore. So you can't play your favorite sport or do your favorite activity. Um, so these are, yeah, I'm just really aware of it, um, to not burn them out and keep it fun. And I, I will get comments to where like, Hey, where's Owen? You must love Milo more. Or like, uh, you know, it's, it, it's the internet. I don't get, I get really, really good comments. Everyone's supportive and it's not a negative space, which I've tried to keep it that way. Um, but people will say, Hey, where's, where's Owen in this video? Or where's Milo? And the, I mean, I don't get into it too much really, but that's it. They just wanted to do something else. They were going to play with their friends. They were going to ride somewhere else or whatever. And I don't want to force them to be a part of something, you know? Yeah. And I think that, you know, it shows in the videos that they're not always in it or they're not, it might be one of them and not the other. And that's, again, I think it's just relatable content is like that, you know, that just like, that's why it's been so successful. And, you know, if you would have listened to Seth five years prior, you know, <laughs> like yeah. I'm sorry, but it's, you just didn't know what it was going to become. I mean, I think you're doing yeah. okay. You've got 172,000 followers on subscribers on YouTube and, I don't know, 40 to 50 K on Instagram. Like it's, it's all part of it and it's great. And it's the cool yeah, thing. It's still growing fast. It's, it's cool. It's uh, every video I put out, it's doing well. And um, the audience is really engaged and connected and into what we're doing. So it's, it's awesome. Um, yeah. Hopefully you never know what things are going to do, but um, it's working now and I'm enjoying it and everyone's enjoying being along for the ride. So um yeah, definitely going to keep on it. Um, you know, your question too about uh, staff and all that stuff. Uh, I know I don't have a staff or anything like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm at that point where I almost should um, have someone helping with editing, but I also enjoy the editing process. And that's the, it's kind of like if you give three different people a bunch of ingredients, you're going to get three different meals, you know, <laughs> and the editing is where it really comes together and the timing and the telling the story and everything. So, um, I'm having trouble. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a giving up, um, control type of thing, but I, I, I just like putting the story together and telling it, but I do run into the roadblock of, I can't put out enough content for what I want to, or what the people want or whatever. So, um, and I also value my life and sanity and family. <laughs> and so I, you know, sometimes it's a month, between videos usually it's a couple weeks um but uh it's just because yeah stuff came up and i'm busy and i'm doing stuff with the family and or i'm doing i'm still you know doing everything else that i always did as a pro writer too with testing product and with writing articles for magazines and planning trips and all that stuff so it's um well more than you know a full-time job for sure but but i love every everything i'm doing and so, um, yeah, just figuring out how to do it myself. And from time to time, I'll bring in someone to help, uh, film or to help, uh, maybe start to pull an edit together or edit something. But for the most part, it's, it's me. Yeah. It's, it's a full-time job. 
Uh, and oh, it's, yeah. you know, it's your <laughs> life and that's the coolest part, but it's, you have to treat it like a job and you still have to, you know, jobs you get to clock out of. And when your life is your job, you have to be completely aware of that. And like, okay, maybe you're editing, but like it's five o'clock and the, you know, kids got soccer. Like you go, you go be a dad and that's, yeah, it's part of it. You know, like, it's just, it's good. It seems like you're very self-aware in that fact of like, it can completely take over your life or take over the filming aspect and having, you know, you just saying the kids can choose what they want to do. Like if they want to go play with their friends and go, or if they want to just go ride bikes, like that's what they do. And you know, sure you want edits out every week, but like you want to be a dad and be a husband. Yeah. And like, those are all things that are important. <laughs> People forget yeah. that I think sometimes. Uh, so it's, it's refreshing to hear you say it. I do. Yeah, there's been a ton of people lose their minds or get burnt out or whatever, um, trying to stay on the weekly schedule or the biweekly schedule. And, you know, the way I look at it is um, because I did that for a while. I was weekly, especially with COVID. And I could do that because um, I didn't have anything else to do. Like everyone's (laughs) stuck at home, you know, we're all quarantined for the whole summer that year, basically. Um, And so it was a lot easier. And then when travel started and other stuff picked back up it got more difficult and so it was weekly to bi-weekly and then sometimes it would be longer than that but the bottom line for me is I have a really high uh quality of standard of quality I guess um and I just won't put something out until I feel like it's done and I'm happy with it and I look at every single video as a something kind of more evergreen styles so it's not time specific or in two years, it's going to be just as good of a video, um, is, is what I try to do. Um, and I just don't want to put out something that I'm not proud of and something I'm not inspired to do. Um, yeah. Quality so over it quantity. Takes a little longer. Exactly. I like that. Um, I want to touch on, and maybe you can't talk about it, but you talked about design and product design, I think, and maybe this is just, we have to delete this whole segment. So we'll leave everyone hanging, but you have a prototype bike out. Um, well, that exists. Are we going to see that soon? What can we know about it? What can we talk about it? I've seen it with my own two eyes, so I know it exists. Um, or is this a mum's award and you can't say nothing? I think it's somewhere in between. Okay. Um, it's not officially launched yet, um, but uh, we're coming out with a really fun, sh- little bit shorter travel 29er trail bike. And um, yeah, I've been riding it for over a year now. And it's, I, most of the time I end up on that bike if I'm going trail riding and I think it's the bike for most people. I think a lot of people are overbiked. So that's where we kind of, um, that's where we came up with this one and it's going to be really fun. And the, the plan is, you know, plans, uh, don't mean much these days anymore, I guess. Uh, it was supposed to already be out, but it should be out in the fall. Um, so with the supply chain and shipping and everything like that, we've run into a lot of problems with it, but um, it's a bike that I really love and that we've spent a lot of time on. And uh, so the plan is to have it out this fall and even uh, ready for people to buy and demo and things like that. Nice. I'm excited to see it. Well, I've seen it, but I'm excited to get on it and actually ride it. Um, Eric sponsors to thank people to thank, um, and where can, I mean, most people know where they can follow you, but like, you know, what's coming up next? Where can they follow you? What do you have coming up? Yeah. Um, YouTube and Instagram is Porter MTB. Um, that's where I put everything up, you know? Um, and then, I mean, huge thanks to my family for being supportive and, you know, my parents, even they weren't mountain bikers, didn't fully understand, but they were always supportive of what I did, which, um, made it possible to, do what I'm doing. It wasn't, I didn't have the parents that were like, Oh, you're never going to make it. And, you know, putting, I didn't have that. I had, they were like, Oh, go give it a shot. You know, worst case scenario, you go get another job. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. And then, um, you know, big thanks to sponsors for sure. Diamondback, uh, it's been 10 years with them, which is insane. That's wild. Um, Yeah. It's a really great run. Good people, good bikes. Um, it's been, it's been awesome there. Um, also work with Pac quite a bit. They're out of Park City and also really good crew and the best protection. Um, Kenda Tires and Camelback, uh, Lazine. Work with a lot of uh, really great uh, people for 
keeping the bike running. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah, what else? Anything else? No. Uh, that, that... Up next, yeah, more more cool videos. So next is uh, the Ecuador video. So I'm battling through those right now. Um, that's uh, that's always the the hardest part is getting finding time to just get the edit edits together um, and be happy with them. But that's what's coming up next. And then, yeah, a bit more travel this summer and um, yeah, just putting on more fun videos and meeting more people in person now that we can have yeah, in person can. events again. I know, right? Well, Eric, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. I know we went back and forth for like the last two, three months. So thanks for fitting it in and making it work. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This is awesome. Love what you guys are doing as well. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.